Good morning, Wake Up HCC. Cris Oviedo here with you in this beautiful Thursday morning. And today's Thursday, May the 20th, and it is just about 10 o'clock. And if you didn't know it, today is National B Day. And you know, it's very appropriate. You would think that, you know, based on that, I decided on the conversation for today because we're actually going to be talking about pollinators and bees or one of the main ones, right? Not the only one, but one of the main ones. And that may come as a surprise to some people. I, I, when I think about, about um, pollinators immediately, you know, immediately what it comes to my mind is bees. And, and as I was reading through this, um, you know, I've had the awareness of some birds and, and, but what really struck me was that even some insects. Um, so it, it's made me look at all little creatures a little bit differently, yeah. <laughs> you know, just through my research. And I hope that maybe that um, gives some insight to, you know, everybody watching and listening to this episode today. But um, Bob, welcome, Bob Marietta. He's the Environmental Health and Safety Supervisor at Howard Community College. He's going to be joining me monthly. We're going to have these conversations about, you know, the environment and about things that, that maybe you did not know. And Today, we're going to focus on pollinators. If the time allows, we'll talk about native plants and things that you can. I know that a lot of people enjoy gardening. Um, I do not believe that I have a green thumb. My thumb is not green at all. I think <laughs> neither one of them is. And But I know a lot of people really enjoy that. So if, if the time allows, we'll talk about gardening and tips also as well. But one fact that I want to start this conversation with is, um, you know, is what's on my caption here. Uh, for the conversation, it says that one out of every three bites of food that we consume comes thanks to the work of the pollinators. When I read that, Bob, it really brought a lot of perspective and a lot of appreciation for this, you know, creatures that I personally feared for many, many years. I had to become really brave to show my kids. <laughs> <laughs> right. So my kids inspired me to be brave. But before that, I mean, I would see a bee and I would go and hide, if, you know, as far away as I could. Um, and I can't say that I had that awareness or that respect for them. So let's let's dive into our conversation. Right. And, and let's first of all, understand what a pollinator is and, and you know, kind of like the importance of of their role in our food chain, you know, and in, 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 our, in our environment. So mm -hmm. good morning and welcome. Good morning, glad to be here with you again. Um, the plants reproduce via pollination uh, and they have a wide variety of mechanisms to do this. Some plants pollinate themselves, but most plants require on somebody else or something else to spread their pollen from the male to the female part of the flower. Okay. And for the flower then uh, generates the seed, which is how the plant reproduces. Now, some plants, we eat the leaves of the plant, we eat the seeds of the plant on a large number of them. And some of them, we actually dig up and eat the roots okay, of the plant. But it's actually, we depend on pollination for almost everything we eat, because even if we don't eat the plant directly, we eat the animals that eat the plant. So almost everything we consume uh, depends on so, uh, some plant being pollinated somewhere along the route. And um, some, some plants uh, rely on the wind or some just rely on gravity uh, to spread their pollen from one part of themselves to another. But most plants rely on outside agencies and, and these we call pollinators. And we ourselves are pollinators. If you go walking through the woods or through the grass or anything, you are a pollinator. And all large animals can be pollinators. And the plants have evolved uh, to have their pollen in a form that's easily transmitted from one place to another. Now, some are not so easy and we're all familiar with things like sticky burrs, okay? and other things that are a real pain if you get into them. And then sometimes those are the seeds that the plant is hoping you'll spread further. In other cases, it's the pollen that they're hoping you'll take to another plant. And so we all participate, okay, in that. Now, insects outnumber us on this world thousands to one, 
okay? And they outnumber all the other pollinators, okay? Um, because of their size, they can get up and inside the flowers of plants. And so the plants have evolved over the years to attract certain pollinators that evolution tells them will spread their pollen to the places where they need it to go. And so they're looking for pollinators that will go from one flower to the next so that they'll pick up the male part of the pollen and deposit it in the female receiving part of the plant. And we, we're all familiar, we know about honeybees, okay? And, uh, but we, we think, okay, that, that's cool, but honeybees are not a native species. Um, and so when the pioneers, and actually the Vikings, they think, uh, came to this country, uh, they brought honeybees with them uh, to produce the honey and to, to take care of pollination. They knew about it way back then that plants needed uh, to spread. And the problem is if you have a monoculture, you know, if you're gonna have corn growing one place and rice in another and all these different plants growing around, you can rely on just random insects to take care of the pollination. But if you want to grow an entire field of one crop, you need to guarantee that you have a pollinator that's going to, you know, be efficient enough to fertilize that entire crop. And um, so honeybees were, were cultivated, okay, for that reason, as well as for their honey. Now, there are other pollinators that are more efficient that farmers raise, and the bumblebees are actually the most efficient pollinator that, that farmers use, okay? And, you know, those big bumbling, slow-moving things, they're covered with furry hairs. And those hairs are perfect for getting the pollen from out of the flower. And so then when they go to the next flower, they rub up against the female parts and spread the pollen around. Now, in this country, we've done such a good job of killing the bees, trying to get rid of the mosquitoes and other things, that we have to import bumblebees from Europe. And we put them in the greenhouses, and there's a big issue of trying to keep them in the greenhouses, because when the colony gets big, it likes to split and go to different places. And so they have to work to keep the honeybee, I mean, the bumblebees under control Otherwise, the European bumblebees go out and uh, cross uh, mutate with the native bumblebees. Uh, and in some cases, force our native bumblebees out. And of course, we're busy trying to kill off our native bumblebees. You know, so it's, uh, it's one of those things we need to stop doing. And the pollinator gardens are part of that effort is to, to promote and take care of the bumblebees. This is fascinating, Bob. I mean, the fact that, that we had to import bees because we are killing our bees and then, you know, how that affects our ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating and, and getting this understanding to me it was eye opening uh, because bumblebees are, are scary. I mean, they're, oh, yeah. they're big. <laughs> Everybody's scared of them. I, I was terrified of them when I first came to Maryland and I would go out into my garden and particularly after a hard day at work, when you're, you're under stress, well, bees communicate with furomes, okay? So they smell when you're upset, okay? So they would all come out to see me and go buzzing around. And of course, if you squat at them, you get more upset. And so more of them come to see what's happening. Now, a bumblebee colony, a full-sized one, may be up to 50 bees. And uh, so you, I've never seen a whole colony come out. Uh, but it doesn't take many to alarm you when they come no. out. Uh, <laughs> but if you'll calm down, they'll check you out and say, oh, they don't smell panicked anymore. There's nothing here. Let's go get some more pollen. Uh, and they'll leave you alone. They can't sting you. And like almost all bees in Maryland, the males can't sting you. There's one female in each colony. And since she's the one protecting the eggs, okay, she has a stinger. Okay. And so sometimes people do get stung, but it's usually when they're doing things like tearing up her fence or something else, which gets them right into the heart of the colony. 
and that'll get the, the female, the queen, okay, coming out to protect her eggs. So that's the one time the bumblebee might, might sting people. And what we encourage people to do is instead of trying to get rid of them, we hear stories about people taking tennis rackets into their gardens with them and uh, smashing the bees to, to keep them away. And uh, I guess a fair amount of exercise if you got to do an entire colony at 50 bees one after another. Uh, but what we would encourage you to do is take an old piece of wood, okay, a two by four or a four by four, and can't be painted or anything because they can't, they don't like to chew through that. But you stick an old board somewhere that, that they can have and put their nests in. And mm. best to put it someplace where you could watch it and observe it, uh, but not where you're going to traffic a lot. And right. definitely not one that's where you're going to pick up and move. Okay. Right. Cause that, that'll excite the queen again. <laughs> and we want to be friends with the queen, but not close friends. Right. Um, <laughs> So, so there are lots of traps and stuff and poisons and stuff that people will try and sell you, okay? But these are pollinators that we need. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we ask people not to try and kill them off and enjoy them as they come around. And um, yeah. the other thing is, is you, you attract them if you're wearing perfume. And so many of our deodorants okay, are based on uh, stuff that smells like flowers. Right. And so you get a bee coming over and he's looking, hey, I smell a flower, where is it? And uh, pe what people really hate is when they get in their hair. And so if you're wearing a, a fruity shampoo or something, that's like a bee invitation. <laughs> so try, try and go with the, the uh, you know, the more organic, okay, smelling things that aren't gonna attract the insects. And of course, bright colors. Uh, mm -hmm. If you wear a dress that looks like a flower, uh, they're going to be attracted to it. Mm. Now, another is in fact, bees, uh, for the most part, can't see the color red. Uh, it looks really? like black. Yeah, it, it looks like black to them because they, they see in the infrared mostly. And uh, so the dark, really dark colors, okay, collect heat. And so that's what they see is that really dark color. Uh, so they won't think that that's a flower. And so this is one of the things they use to try and control uh, the bees is by using red flowers where they where they where they don't want them to go, mm -hmm, you know things, mm -hmm. things like geraniums and stuff. Um, right. So it's it's interesting the things that they're learning about how these bees act, actually operate. You know, and it's 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 fascinating to me because. Um, my relationship with bees was never one that I, you know, took seriously necessarily, right? Like it was just this annoying bugs that were flying around and I would, like you said, just run them away mm -hmm. and then they would continue to come. And, you know, then I did, I didn't, I, I have killed a few bees in my life and I'm right. sorry. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think I we all have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I've learned to respect them because I've made this connection of, you know, how good they are for, for me, for my family, how literally my food depends on the work that these bees are doing. So I have really kind of um, shifted my mind and I'm trying to teach my, my kids. So my kids will run away from them. They totally will run away from them and hide, but they're not doing what I was doing, which is, you know, just trying to get rid of them, which yeah. is, is, is already, a, I think, a step in the right way. And, and I hope that as they continue to, to learn more about the bees and, and, and develop and, and grow older, they will learn to do what I do, which is kind of like stand still. I just yeah. stand still and I'm like, okay, just smell me and go away. Please don't sting me, right. you, you know. <laughs> and, and the spraying of poisons uh, should, should always be avoided because uh, any poison we put into the environment is going to come into us uh, one way or another. And you don't, they don't have just honeybee poison. You know, it's you spray poison around, it's going to kill, kill all of them. Yeah. And uh, the insecticides that people put on their skin, uh, most people think, well, it, it's going to kill the bees if he tries to bite me, so they won't bite me. But actually what the insecticide, the bug spray does is make you not smell good okay, to the bee or to the mosquito. Okay? So you smell like something not to eat. And so that when that wears off and you can, the, the 
amount of chemical that's in them, the smelling or unsmelling chemical, uh, the strength of it determines how many hours it will last. And so some of them are made to last six hours, some for just two hours. Generally, the more natural ingredient ones last less time. And it's important if you're going out in the sun that you always put on the, the sunscreen first and then the repellent on top of it. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you'll cover up the repellent and it won't deter the insect. Okay. He may taste it when he bites you, but he'll already, he'll already have, have bitten you. you know. <laughs> so now they're starting to make products that have both mm. uh, in it. And um, so maybe that'll help people more because we do need to uh, be prepared. And we're going in places where the insects, the mosquitoes, the ticks, right. and those sorts of things are. You need to put those repellents okay, on, on yourself and on your children. Are there any natural things that we can put on like if i'm going to go outside and garden right is there anything that i can maybe sp spray on me or rub on me and um, something natural that i may find in my kitchen something that they may not be appealing yeah there are a large number of uh, uh organic pro natural products uh that you can use and the uh, bug spray companies are now starting to market them okay and you'll see things like lemongrass and citronella uh, and other things built into off, okay, and the other, you know, commercial brands, okay, that we think of, because they, they realize there's a market for those things now. Um, the deep one, uh, we call it military strength, okay, um, is, is, can be harmful. So they caution you not to put it on children and only use certain strengths, okay, of it. Uh, it actually melts plastic, if you're wondering how strong it is. Wow. Um, so the strengths they had that, that you could spray on yourself, okay, are, are not going to melt plastic, but you do want to be careful. You don't want to get them on your lips, okay, or in your eyes. And the natural products are much more friendly uh, toward, particularly towards putting it on children. Mm -hmm. I have forgotten that I put a box spray on you and, you know, kind of put my hands <laughs> or my eyes or my mouth and it, it does it not taste well and it does not go very well. It's right, not a pleasant, right. <laughs> it's not a pleasant experience. Right. We've There's also about plants you can put in your yard uh, that mm -hmm. the bugs don't like. Okay. Uh, things like citronella or the, uh, there's a native geranium. They put out anything that has a uh, natural oil, mint plants, uh, for example. Uh, the bugs don't like those. So mm. all of your uh, so-called essential oils. Okay. Uh, don't taste good to the bugs. And, uh, so they're, they're good to use. Interesting. Very interesting. So there's ways that we can, you know, kind of like keep our distance that those, I, I, I will admit with the insects, I really have been practicing social distancing <laughs> since I was little. <laughs> and I plan to keep that up even after, you know, COVID and all, all restrictions are lifted. I'll continue my distancing with the bugs as much as possible. We've talked about pollinators uh, as essential for a healthy environment, right? And, and for sustainable food supply. Like that's what I started. So they're saying that one out of every three bites that we take is related to that. I wanna unpack that a little bit more uh, with you, Bob. Um, you know, let's let's talk about the environment. Let's talk about the effect that pollinators have in our environment and how they support and create a healthy environment for us. Okay. Well. Any plant or all plants or almost all plants uh, rely on pollination to, to reproduce. Okay? And so if we want a healthy uh, ecosystem, okay, we need to promote the plants so that they can spread and uh, they'll continue to grow if they're not pollinated, but they won't produce new plants. Okay? And we know we need plants uh, for a wide variety of reasons to help clean our air, Okay. Uh, for example, the plants take, take in the CO2 and produce the oxygen. That, that's a real simplification because plants also breathe in oxygen uh, and exhale CO2, but they produce much more oxygen than they produce CO2. Um, so we definitely need plants to do that. Plants also filter our water and they guide our water. Uh, uh, plants' roots will guide the water down into the ground so that it will replenish our water supply. 
And as it soaks through the ground, it gets filtered. And all those harmful things that we've put into it or other atmospheric things have gotten into the water are filtered out through the soil. So by the time it gets down to what we call the aquifer, it, it's pure water. And we can tap into that for our wells or for our water systems and, and bring it up. Now, plants that do not have deep roots, like uh, turf grass, you know, we all like our lawns, they do not put down deep roots. And so the water that lands on them simply runs off okay? and still carrying all the pollution and other things that it's picked up, trash from the roads and oil and stuff, all that carry, gets carried down into the streams, which then gets carried down to the Chesapeake Bay um, where it affects the food system, okay, down there, and the industries that we all depend on, okay, for, for the bay. Uh, so we would like to encourage people to plant native plants that have deep roots so that they can funnel that water down there. Now, any tree that spreads its canopy of leaves up in the air is going to slow down the fall of rain. So we don't think about a single raindrop having much impact on anything. But if we take a mess of them, uh, one gallon of water weighs eight pounds. So if we think of hitting the earth with an eight pound sledgehammer okay, in the middle of a rainstorm and the ground's getting soft already, we're making a deep impact and we're loosening even more soil, which is then gonna be washed downstream. So trees help to help to slow that. And one of the uh, principal things that municipalities are trying to do is to have people plant trees around streams and around lakes so that the rainfall that's hitting them gets a chance to slow down and soak into the ground rather than washing okay, um, the poisons they have in the raindrop and anything else they pick up along the way, washing that into our streams, okay, in, into our lakes and down into the bay. Um, Bob, let me, let me just ask you a question. And I know this has caused some controversy, right? But um, Ellicott City, right? And the uh -huh. flaws in Ellicott City. There has always been a talk about, well, it's all of, all of the development that's happening around Ellicott City. And that's part of the reason why we've seen this um, flooding happen, you know, so, so, quickly really, you know, falling like just a couple of years behind the other. Um, is this the explanation for that? Is it is it that when we are taking away nature environments, natural environments and 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 building, you know, complexes, houses, whatever that may be. It's part of it. away those barriers? Yeah, it, it's part of it. Uh, obviously if we put something an impervious surface that the water can't soak into and we don't provide someplace else for the water to pause and soak into the ground, it's gonna flow downhill. Now, Ellicott City was built as a mill. Okay. So the pioneers took those early streams and rebuilt them so that the water would flow faster. Okay, because you wanted to turn the wheels of the mill. Okay. So the entire structure of that town was built that way. And so the uh, very early on, the streams were lined with rock okay, and, the, and built up with walls. And so the um, people in the town then looking for flat places to build said, hey, let's throw some boards across these two walls around the stream and let's build up. And since there was, who, who owns above the stream? Okay, so they were able to get land cheaply by occupying space where people, other people didn't want to go. Now, in recent years, uh, that whole area has been occupied. So people went uphill okay, to find land where they could spread out okay, and build. And the rules at that time were very loose as to how much water you tried to hold that they did have some ponds and things that were supposed to catch the water. Um, but then there wasn't enough, okay, even then. And then climate change came along and the raindrops were getting heavier and rainfalls were getting 
more intense. So since the atmosphere was warmer, the air could hold more water okay, at one time. And when it was released, more water came to the ground at one time. So it was the effects were magnified. And this water then, since nothing was holding it up there, there weren't plants or ponds up there. And plants would have, the forest uh, with their deep roots would have allowed the water to soak in. But when we took down those trees and didn't build enough ponds, and that's one of the things the county is doing is building a really big pond up there uh, to catch that water. So, you know, it's it's really, and and thank you for answering the question. I know it has nothing to do with pollinators, but um, <laughs> I mean, everything that's in the environment is connected, right? As, as, yep. as we're learning with you. And, you know, this is not to, to con, this is not really meant to, um, yeah, it's, it's really not meant to judge or anything like that. It's, it's really it's really not a comment. It's really just so that um, we have an understanding as citizens, right, of whatever is happening around our environment that's changing it. You just said, you know, adding a big pond is just having this awareness of, okay, we're going to, if we're going to build here, we need to make sure that we're building in a way that is protecting and, and the, the environment. Is, they're, they're helping people build rain gardens. Uh, to catch the water with plants that will let the water soak in. They're encouraging people to put in rain barrels. So to catch the water that comes off their roof and, and mm -hmm. to spread it out so it soaks in slowly. And they put in a big alarm system. So if they do have a big heavy rain, everybody knows to get ready okay, that right. it might be coming. So we won't be caught short again like we were in the past. Right, so it's a controversial thing and it's something that affected many of our neighbors here in Harry County. And it's important to have these conversations from this place of, of knowledge and of power because um, we continue to grow, we continue to expand. Um, growth is, it's, it's happening, it's, it's, it's in the future of, of the county, it's, it's, everywhere, it's everywhere we look, right? right. But what I, I think it's important and where I, where I think we can make a difference is having this type of conversations, having this type of um, awareness and really building with the environment, like in conjunction with the environment. And we've talked about this before with you, Bob, where, you know, we can continue to grow, we can continue to build, we can continue to do and expand, but it's really, really important that we take in consideration the environment and that planning process, not as an afterthought, right. um, you know, based and, on what happened. Howard County is in the forefront of that, right? Right now we're going through this, they're calling it HOCO by design. And they're looking at what sort of things we can, should consider uh, as we go forward and change our general plan and have our master plan uh, for the next 20 years. So we're considering all these issues and I'd encourage everybody to get involved with that process uh, if you're interested. It's HOCO by design. Uh, and you can Google it and get involved. Lots of public meetings, a lot, a lot of it online, okay, right now, so that you can tell people how you, uh, what your concerns okay, are about things. Um, important to note, though, that Ellicott City is not the only place that floods. Uh, right here in downtown Columbia, uh, we've had several of the big floods where Route 29, half of it has gone underwater, okay, the, uh, the west side of it. Uh, We've had a number of times here on campus where we've had foot high floods uh, washing through our parking lots. And that's because these heavy rainstorms are much more localized and, uh, and very, very intense. And they're called thousand year floods. And, and when you have them every couple of years, <laughs> it, 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 the science is changing. Uh, we used to, everything had to be prepared for a hundred year flood. Okay. And uh, but now we're looking at it and say, well, it, those numbers don't right, work right anymore. We need to prepare everybody for a thousand year flood okay, when they're coming. And it, it goes back in a large part to the plants. Uh, when we plant native plants, uh, they have evolved uh, to grow in our situation, in our soil, uh, in, our in our changing environment. Uh, if we plant what we call exotic or invasive species, uh, quite often things happen naturally that can wipe out an entire population. And if that invasive species has already been allowed to wipe out a native population, there's nothing left. And so that's when we get huge erosion events, okay, washing down. There's nothing to stop the rain. 
uh, nothing to stop the soil washing away because we've killed off the native plants with the invasive plants. And uh, it, it's something that people are learning. The, uh, the plant stores, okay, the knowledgeable gardeners are, are learning about this and have the native plants uh, for sale. The uh, mass marketplaces, Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff, uh, work on a very tighter profit margin. And so they oftentimes don't have the native plants available. Uh, so you need to go to a local local garden place and ask them specifically uh, for the natives. And they love to talk. So they're, they're like me. They'll, they'll explain to you in great detail uh, what plants you should be planting and where and why. And, uh, that's and we all need to have those dogs. Yeah. We need to. We really do. We really do. Because I'm, I'm one who cannot say, like, I look at my garden. I'm looking at it right here in front of my window. And I can't say that I know what I have in front of me. I really don't know they're, whether they're exotic, whether they're native. Like I, I just, you know, I don't have that awareness. And it's important if we want to take care of our environment and we want to make sure that um, we protect ourselves against those flaws and we give ourselves the best opportunity to enjoy nature and grow with, with the environment that we're in, we need to learn those things. We need to learn how to take care of our environment so it can take care of us as well. Right. And, and they, there's some tools now that have made it easier uh, online where you can actually go out and take a picture of a plant and it'll tell you what the plant is and uh, with, whether it's a native or an invasive and tell you lots of other information about it. So I really encourage people to do those. I can't remember all the Latin names of all the plants or anything anyway. So I'm constantly taking, taking pictures and looking things up. Any good apps that you can recommend that people can go and download today? My favorite right now is a free one called iNaturalist. All right, iNaturalist. So I recommend, I will download it because like I said, I am really, really bad. My thumb has many colors. Green is not one of them. So I really want to bring that hue, a little bit of that hue at least. And, and if, if technology and app can help me do that, I'm, I'm all for that. Let's start going back to our conversation of pollinators and you know, kind of like retake that. Um, we talked about how they help the environment and that's how we got carried away, um, you know, speaking about flooding and, and rain and, and, and all of that. But um, I want to go back to this idea of our food because I think that relationship and, and to me that has been the absolute most um, eye-opening, the one that has really influenced me the most and the one that really transformed the way that I saw pollinators and, and, and really change that relationship and how I react and see them. And I think that that's, you know, because, because I see that, I see a bee and now I can really clearly see my fruits, my vegetables being effective if I don't, if I don't take care of it. Like I was able to make that strong relationship and that really helped me appreciate and take care, better care of them um, in whatever little bit I can do here at home. So I want to talk a little bit more about that. I want you to tell us, Bob, a little more about that relationship and how important it is. You started to say earlier, you know, about the wood and how we can help them. And, and that's where I want to go. And we think that only the professionals, only those who work in those um, arenas and those careers have the power to make a difference. Um, but what I love about our conversations with you is that you actually say, um, and you invite us all to be part of it and to do something at home. So how can we make sure that we don't run out of food by <laughs> taking care of the pollinators and what can we do to, to, to do that at home? Okay, well, well, Maryland is fortunate because of our climate. Uh, despite what we do with all the air pollution and stuff, it's an unhealthy air day today. Um, but we do have a change of seasons uh, and it's very gentle. And many, many parts of the country don't have that. It's, you know, uh, slamming from hot to cold. Uh, but we have some gentle transition there. And that's very good for the insects and, and for the plants. It gives them a chance to get started and grow healthy. And so we really enjoy it. We have 400 different species of bees, okay, in Maryland. Okay. And like I've said, mo most of them, only the queen can, can sting you. Uh, most of them don't form colonies. Uh, the, the bumblebees uh, form are one of the few native ones that actually forms a colony. Uh, honeybees form colonies who you know the beehives. And, and that's when they sting you is when you try and mess with their, 
with their beehive. <laughs> but, um, but all, of all these species, I have to ask, is that from experience that you know that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we have hives here on campus. And uh, I, I do admit that, uh, you know, I, I have gotten stung, okay, from them. And the uh, culinary folks operated here. But of course, I was too impatient to put on the bee suit and stuff. So I went walking up to see the hives and, and uh, did, did get stung. Um, but it wasn't that bad. I uh, felt like getting my uh, flu shot or my, uh, <laughs> my, my vaccine. Um, but most of the bees in Maryland live in holes in, in wood or in the ground, and they are solitary. Okay? And we need all 400 of them to pollinate our plants and particularly our food and in our local gardens. And if you talk to a local gardener, they'll tell you how much how painful it is to have to try and pollinate plants by themselves. Okay, and you can see pictures online of the farmers in in China and other parts of East Asia, and they have these pickup trucks with ladders hanging all over them, so that people are reaching out their arms in all directions, and they drive down through the orchards so that people can lean off these ladders and shake all the tree branches uh, to pollinate the trees. And uh, so it's, uh, it's a lot of work that the insects can take care of for us. And of course, the reason they do that is because they spread poisons to kill specific pests and wind up killing off all of their pollinators. So we need to be very careful about when and how we use these poisons. Now, we've, we've all heard lately about the neonicotinoids, okay? and these are poisons made with uh, nicotine, okay, basically. We know how bad that is for us, um, and it just wipes out the insect populations, and unfortunately, it's not a short-lived poison, and people that will, uh, uh, gardening places that will set, make up and sell plants and trees will treat the plant with these nicotinoids so that you'll take it home and it won't get eaten by insects until you forget where you purchased it. And then you won't be bringing it back to, to get your money back. Okay. Um, but those nicotinoids are in the soil now and into our environment. And they're learning about the long-term impacts uh, that those have on the environment and on us uh, directly. So we're trying to discourage people uh, from using those neonicotinoid uh, insecticides. And if you do have to use an insecticide, there are naturally incur occurring uh, things, neem oil and other sorts of things that you can target to kill a specific pest. Say if your crop gets invaded by aphids or something, there are natural short-lived things that you can do. Now, actually long-term, what we'd like you to do is encourage the native insects that like to eat you know, if you've got aphids, encourage praying mantises, okay, to come and ladybugs and let them eat the aphids, okay, rather than you having to try and, and spot kill them. But we've, lately, we've, we, we want instant success, okay. Uh, we want to, want to kill the problem right now and fix it and so that we can sell our crop, okay, and fi finance the next crop, okay, basically. Um, far farmers, particularly in Maryland, are learning more and more uh, and taking the lead across the country is what's called restorative agriculture. And they're learning how to do things in their soil and in the surrounding environment that actually make their crops uh, healthier okay, and stronger by using the natural methods. And of course, these then lead to less water running off because it stays into the fields which means the farmers have to do less irrigation okay, and other things. And since their crops grow better and stuff, they can uh, charge more money for them. So they see a great, greater profit margin. Mm -hmm. um, but well, this, I have know, a question yeah. for you because you just said, you know, let the ladybugs and, and encourage them to come. How do I invite them to come? You're like, like I'm at home and I'm like, I have an issue and I need ladybugs. How do, how do I bring them? Like, like so many things nowadays, you can actually go online and order a thousand ladybugs okay. uh, or praying mantises or other things. Um, so 
people have realized that there is, it is a market, okay, for these methods. But rather than just reaching out for a solution, we would encourage people to do a little bit of research. And it may be you don't need ladybugs, you might need something else, okay? So go online, go to the extension service. Howard County has great connections at their Live Green Howard County uh, website, where you can find out a lot of information. And the, uh, the, the government, the Agricultural Extension Service uh, does a lot of workshops and puts out other information uh, aimed for farmers and gardeners, okay? That's, that's their mission. Uh, is to promote that. So they can share a lot of good, helpful information with you, okay, on that. But getting back to the pollinators, okay. Um, the, the most fearful thing most people are afraid of with insects is not bees, <coughs> excuse me, it's wasps, okay. And yellow jackets are not bees, yellow jackets are wasps. And by the, for the most part, wasps do not pollinate flowers. Okay, they are meat eaters. And at certain times of the year, uh, they will look for meat and in the fall, they'll look for fruit. And this is the way they've evolved. They need the sugars in the fall uh, to build up so that their young can survive the winter, okay, in the nest. Uh, early in the year, they need that protein and I don't know, the meat eaters so that they uh, get the energy Okay, uh, to spread and you know scavenge for more food. Um, they love sodas. Okay, um, all those uh, drinks that we have now, you know, the energy drinks and stuff like that. Uh, one of the easiest things you can do is to make sure you empty it all out on the ground when you're done, because you put that can in the recycling container. I hope, and the uh, yellow jackets are going to smell it out and say, oh boy, here we got carbohydrates, we got proteins, and we got sugar. So they're going to go in there and to get a drink and get their energy, and you go to mess with it or come near it, and they think you're wanting their food, okay. and that's when they attack, and wasps, for the most part, can sting you multiple times. The honeybee uh, loses its stinger, usually in you, uh, and if you do get stung by a honeybee, you want to get that stinger out. Okay? Uh, don't want to leave it in there. Uh, but the wasps will sting you multiple times. Okay? So we want to try and discourage them. Now, they also don't like those uh, essential oil uh, smelling things, the geraniums and the mints and stuff. So you can uh, create a landscape that discourages them. But mostly it's take care of your trash. Because uh, people all know what it's like when they invade a picnic, and uh, you know, because they're they're just looking looking for something to eat, and you're providing the the favorite thing for them. You know, I didn't realize that it was the sodas that were calling them to the trash cans. Like you always find them at the trash can. That's the place if you're ever looking for a wasp, right. you just need to go to the trash can. You're most likely yep. going to find them there. But I really, I, I thought it was the other food that was there. I did not realize that it was actually the sugary, the sodas yep. that were calling them. Well, they'll, they'll go for the hamburger meat in, in the spring, okay? And they'll go for the fruit in, in the fall, but the sodas have both. And so that, that's why that attracts them the most. Now, there's, there are some wasps that are very good to have. We all know about the mud daubers. And, and we hate those little uh, finger-like mud pies that they make on our sides of our buildings and stuff. But you'd never believe what mud daubers' favorite food is. Spiders. <laughs> yeah. And they particularly like black widow spiders. Really? Really. And they wow. will actually get down and grub under boards and things uh, where black widow spiders like to be. And um, you just made this really difficult because it's like, do I keep those wasps or do I keep the spiders? <laughs> like, which one did I take? Yeah. Um, so the idea is to provide other places uh, for those wasps to build. And the mud daubers particularly like something that's under shelter. Okay, you can see them under your eaves and sort of stuff. So if you can provide a place on your fence and also provide a place where they can get mud. Now, so often when we put in a lawn today, we put bushes around our foundation of our houses and we throw down mulch. 
And chances are we put down, that's not good enough to stop the weeds. So we put down fabric under that. So that poor wasp is looking for some place to get some mud and he's really got to work for it because you've covered it all up. And a lot of our native bees nest in the ground. So they need some bare soil, okay, too. So we would encourage people instead of uh, fabricing and mulching and covering everything up, instead plant some nice pretty plants close enough together. Now, uh, the standard nowadays is to plant uh, what we call ground cover plants and plant them a couple of feet apart, okay, and spread. So in the winter, particularly, it looks like we have these little clumps growing out of the mulch. Now, I don't find that very attractive at all, but you can, if you plant those plants a little close together, okay, when they flower out, leaf out, they will cover the ground, okay? So you don't have a need for mulch, but the weed seeds won't see any sunlight, so they won't spread as well. So that, that's the newer method now. We're trying to put these plants closer together. The reasoning for not putting them closer together uh, was that eventually they'll grow too close together and you'll have to go back and divide them and spread them out somewhere else or give those plants away to somebody else, okay? So the landscaping people, the way their contracts are written uh, are not rewarded for doing things that they wanted to last for a few years. And so they're, they're trying to build in that look. And so you have a few years there before it fills in where you've got those bare spots, just that mulch in between there. Um, we encourage them uh, to say, well, here, you can make more money if people have to hire you to come back and divide those plants. Okay. And um, so it's a learning curve. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's new stuff. And of course, now a large part of their industry is based on spreading mulch okay, a couple times a year. And particularly the colored mulch uh, should be avoided uh, because of the chemicals used to make that coloring, okay, in the mulch. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's all about when we're going that way, it's all about the looks. We do think, I, I think, you know, as consumers a little bit about what it's doing to our soil, but I can't say that when I go looking for mulch or, or when I've done that, it's been thinking of the environment or anything like that. It's always been about matching with my house yeah. and what's going to look best. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's like you said, it's a learning curve. It's really rethinking of how is this supporting my environment? How is this really supporting my house? The pollinators, the food that I'm, is going to be available to me. I mean, it's really, you know, just really building up on that knowledge and, and, and expanding our, that chain so we can make better choices for our environment and, in turn mm -hmm. for ourselves. Um, speaking of that, um, Bob, how does HEC take care of the pollinators? What's HEC doing? You kind of mentioned uh, briefly about, um, you know, the, the pollinator gardens at HEC, and I want you to tell us more about that. Okay, we've sent a number of people uh, to what is called the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Training. And this is courses that are training people that actually do landscaping or are responsible for landscaping how to take care of their landscape and how to create their, their landscape. So we've had a number of our employees go through that. And we're starting to modify the older plantings uh, that we have and uh, make them more sustainable as we write our specifications for new plantings, new buildings, we're incorporating these uh, principles okay, into it. You'll see these a lot in the MAC, the new math and the athletics building that's in planning right now, you'll start to see it in the SET building and a little bit in the health sciences building where you start to see the native plants and the rain gardens and other things around. And those are mostly driven by the stormwater uh, regulations, which say that 40% of the rain that falls on that piece of property has to stay there, okay, and soak in. Um, we're, we're working more and more with the plantings. And the most recent thing we've done is Howard County donated uh, 25 trees to us, flowering trees, to create a pollinator garden at this uh, most recent Green Fest, which was mostly virtual. We out had a group of uh, teenagers from the Volunteens program 
and we had the Howard County Echo Works uh, landscaping crew actually teach the teenagers how to plant these trees. And the master gardeners of Howard County designed the layout of those trees. And it's right by the parking lot uh, across the street from the Clark Library. And it's a, it will be a, a meandering path through flower beds and flowering trees there to attract the pollinators okay, to, to that area. And the location of it is, is very, um, very thoughtful because the Clark Library is named after uh, Senator Clark, whose family were some of the pioneers of restorative agriculture uh, in the country and put Howard County in the forefront of things like the corn drill and the no-till planting, okay? things that were designed uh, to work and to reduce the soil erosion, reduce how much fertilizer and stuff is needed okay, to have a successful uh, agricultural operation. And it's, it's, it's spread throughout Howard County, through, throughout the country, and uh, I heard it's even gone overseas now uh, that these techniques that they developed a uh, hundred years ago. And um, so and it's, it's fitting that we have this pollinator garden uh, next to Senator Clark's library. So we are attracting the pollinators and are we trying to, what are we trying to obtain from this? Is it, is it just so that we can have more bees? Is it just to, to grow the number of bees that we have locally? Are we trying to get honey of it? What are, what's the goal with the pollinator? Okay. Uh, we're trying to encourage pollinators, uh, yes, um, but we're not trying to encourage honeybees in that area. The college's honeybee hives are located in an out of the way area, uh, back by what an area we call the uh, Arboretum, which is a hill in between the athletic fields and the athletic building. Uh, and I encourage everybody to go up there and take a look. Um, but that's where the, the beehives are. Now we tried to put all the exotic or non-native species that we plant these days, we plant there in the Arboretum. And so the bees, honeybees fit right in since they're, they're not native. Um, the, tr the hillside there was the home of the, uh, the farmhouse of the Clark Dairy. I'm sorry, the Bassler Dairy. And when James Rouse uh, set aside land uh, for the community college, he traded the Bassler Dairy, a farm out in Clarksville. And so they moved their operation out there and the property became Howard Community College. So they had a number of plants there on around their house, uh, one of which is this huge beech tree, which is estimated to being over 200 years old. And, uh, yeah, and that's something, and lots of others. And we work with a lot of the local groups, the Howard County Forestry Board, um, Sierra Club, uh, Master Gardeners, Transitions, Howard County, lots of groups have uh, partaken uh, of doing things in the Arboretum. And we have signage on the trees uh, that are there uh, to tell people what they are so you can identify native and non-native okay, trees, but we, we have pretty rigid controls so that they don't spread uh, out, outside of that area. Um, so we're trying to encourage the bees, or the native bees, okay, and the other pollinators. We also have bat houses. Bats are, are big time pollinators. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we, we're gonna do a, a big educational push, okay, there at the pollinator garden. Now, Howard County, part of giving us the plants was they are now designated as a bee city which means they encourage pollinator gardens and other things to promote pollinators all over the county. So that's why they gave us the trees. Um, and so we're gonna be doing educational uh, posters and signage and other things. And the uh, folks in the science department uh, are working with us. Uh, they'll be taking people on tours down through that area to identify the pollinators and the uh, geology classes are going to be identifying the rocks that can be seen along that path. Uh, so we're, we're making very good educational use, okay, of that piece of property. 
Absolutely. Real, real experience. You know, just you can go and see it. You can go and, and, and recognize it. You can go and familiarize yourself with it, which is what I think we all need to do in getting familiar with it, getting comfortable with it so that, that when we can learn to live with that and maybe bring it to our own homes. The beehives, um, are we trying to get honey from the beehives? What are we doing with them? We, we do. The culinary department uh, gets the honey. Okay, and uses it in their baking class and their candy class. Uh, so it all goes to a good educational purpose uh, there in the culinary area. Yeah. That's and, and they also take take the students out to the to the hives and teach them about caring for the bees. You know, for people who want to connect, for people who are um, interested in learning more, who are maybe just trying to understand and make sense and saying like, wow, this seems a little overwhelming and it feels like I need to make a lot of changes, right? Where can they go? Where's a good place to start? Um, how can they maybe even connect with you if you wanna have a conversation? Oh, yeah. well, well, you can get, connect with me at the college. I'd love to talk it with everybody, but the best site we have available is the Live Green Howard County. Okay. And uh, we, we put our stuff on there and all the other organizations in the area had their connections through that live green Howard County. What's the message that you have for everybody today, Bob, that you want everybody to keep after a conversation today? Do, do one little thing, okay? You can't do it all, okay? But find one little thing that's good for yourself and good for the environment and, and do that today. So go do that today. Go that do that one thing that's good for you yep. for the environment. Let's. I think that that's what I encourage everybody. And I think that's the message I want to leave everybody. Many times we do things and we don't think of the effect that those things have on our environment. Um, let's start bringing that, that, that idea. Let's start bringing that concept into everything that we do. What am I going to do today? And how is that affecting my environment? How is that affecting the place that I live? How is that going to affect the food? How is that going to affect the generations coming behind me? Right. Because I want to make sure that they have the planet that they can enjoy, like I have had the privilege of having. So um, let's make that shift. Let's become a little more aware of our environment, the influence that we have in our environment, and take the one little step, like Bob just said. Thank you, Bob, for the conversation. Oh, always. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. And Bob will be back next month. If maybe you have ideas, you have questions, you have topics that you want us to cover, please email me at moviedo at howardcc.edu. That's moviedo at howardcc.edu. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please share with this with your friends, your family. If you have questions, visit that website. Reach out to Bob. Reach out to me. Take care of yourself, take care of our environment, enjoy the rest of the Thursday and have a beautiful day. Until next time, I'm Cris Oviedo.